On January 12, 1960, George Jackson was sentenced to one year to life for a $70 gas station robbery. He would serve 11 years, seven months, with seven of those years in solitary confinement. On August 21, 1971, he was assassinated. In the intervening years, Jackson penned two centerpieces of revolutionary canonical texts, Soledad Brother and Blood in My Eye. you will see and hear Jackson's ideas spoken, performed, and reflected by artists, activists, comrades, loved ones. The people to whom he spoke who now speak him back to us. Welcome to this special edition of I Mix What I Like, George Jackson releasing The Dragon, a video mixtape. is transformation of our mind. Powerful mechanism to transform our emotion is conviction. Not just a single point of view of mind. In order to increase the ability of reasoning, study is very, very important. While I was incarcerated under a wonder light, 
a term they call for one life where I could have done one year and been released. I've done 10. That's more time than anybody in the state has ever done on a one life. When the prison gates fly open, the dragon will emerge. August 21st, 1971. The dragon has come. I said the dragon has come. Mr. George. In 1960, when he was 18, he was falsely accused of stealing 70 dollars from a gas station. Nope, there was evidence of his innocence. He was convinced to plead guilty so he can receive a life sentence. Instead, he was given a once a life, but he served 10 years, and that ain't right. Seven and a half was spent in solitary confinement. Label him as a threat because of his movement. Soon he met. Mark Slinner and Mal, Black Gorilla family, Rathini, how? Studying economics and military ideas. No longer when he feared a revolution was near. In 1970, you won't believe three black inmates killed the OG. Miller, due to the color of their skin, even though they rumbling, it was murder in the end. Three days later, court ruled in favor, justified homicide. Took away their life, someone had to pay the price. Prison guard John Mills killed for payback. George Jackson, one of the suspects. Angela Davis came to his defense. August 7th, 1970, his brother Jonathan wanted to see him free. Walk in the courtroom and took hostages. Attempted to free three other convicts. All had weapons and gave this message. We are revolutionaries. The soul of dead brothers must be free. He was only 17, but now he was a man. Popped in a getaway van. Drove toward the San Quentin sergeant. Police didn't care for the civilians. Shot in a van, killing him and his gunmen. George Jackson was moved to San Quentin. While in prison, he became an instant celebrity due to the release of Solar Dead Brother, but he still had to suffer. Reality, he will never be released. Kill me if you can, not kill me if you please. If I leave alive, I'm leaving nothing behind. They will never count him among the broken men. August 21st, 1971, George Jackson, the dragon has come, but how come? He was assassinated, vindicating comrades for injustice. He was a blade in the throat of fascism. Trying to free inmates from a control mechanism called racism. True revolutionary, black militant, Mr. George Jackson. George Jackson, revolutionary. George Jackson, revolutionary. George Jackson, the revolutionary. George Jackson, the revolutionary. George Jackson, the revolutionary. Let me show these suckers how to ball out here. Oh man, let me get this together here. Oh, lay up. Oh no. Shot. Oh, three. Three. Oh, it's like Brick City out here. Mid range. Goodness, I can't buy a bucket out here. I missed the whole damn basket. Oh my god, what's going on, man? My game is looking trash. Rap. Oh, here we go. Black Power Media shirt. Now we cooking. Now we cooking. Tree, tree. I'm taking all three of y'all with these right here. Between the legs. Oh my goodness, behind the back. Lay up. Oh, and did he just do a reverse? He is in beast mode out here. I ain't got to look. It's falling. Oh my goodness, this guy is going three. One, Kobe! Nice. Black Power Media, baby! Nice. Empower yourself. Go get you some of that Black Power Media again. Right here, blackpowermedia.org. Yeah. I mix what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like. Yes, indeed. What's up, world? Welcome to another edition of I Mix What I Like right here at Black Power Media. Of course, I'm Jared Ball. Happy to be your host. And you know what it is. You know who they are. Dev Springer in the building, host of Groundings Podcast, revolutionary journalist, artist, activist, organizer, 
remixer chat room extraordinaire what's up dev good morning welcome thanks for joining me and us this morning how you doing hey assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh to all my all my comrades and people listening in uh, I appreciate you, Jared, for calling me a revolutionary journalist, but I don't call myself that. I think I still got um, many, 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 many more years ahead of me to earn that title. But okay. glad to be here. I'm a huge, fran- huge fan of uh, I Mix What I Like. I got up extra early today, started my day early <laughs> <laughs> to be here. So, you know, let's get into some things for real. All right, I appreciate you. So first thing, before we before we move uh, any farther, I did want to um, let everybody know uh, that, um, first of all, well, all right. I want to let everybody know uh, that, uh, of course, we're commemorating Black August here. And as I had intended to pull up faster than I am now, I wanted to share very quickly um, what we're sort of the link is already uh by the way shout out to my man bashi rose uh and to the struggle that went into producing uh that video mixtape tribute to george jackson please check it out the link is in the show description uh it was it was uh um it was it was a a struggle and i uh and and one day we'll come back and talk more about the context Uh, i think i've shared some of it but um Please go check that out. Also in the show description is this link here, uh, which Kalanji has shared with us from the Siafu movement, uh, Black August Defined. uh, And just very quickly here, Black August is about resistance. It is an annual commemoration rather than celebration of our political prisoners, those who lost their lives during the 1970s in the gulags of California, along with the hundreds who are currently languishing under torturous conditions, being denied their basic human rights across the United States. So we invite folks to uh, support Black August resistance and understand the actual context. And we'll talk more about that throughout the platform, Kalanji, I'm sure will himself. Um, but just to remind folks that it, it's, it's not like another you know, it's not another holiday. It's not a a celebration. It is. And and the the focus is initially the the, uh, political prisoners and the black liberation struggle that produced them. Uh, Anyway, so Dev, let me let me invite you to share any initial thoughts in in, as it regards to Black August. And then um, let's get into some of the details as to why you've you've joined us this this morning uh and and go from there and i'll pull up some of the the links you had uh sent for me to 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 get ready so yeah absolutely absolutely and revolutionary greetings to everyone happy first day of black august um i start off by saying you know i'm not the authority on black august there's people like kalanji or my good comrade sister erica Keynes, you know who who that's their bag for real but um I come today celebrating the the ancestors and the martyrs alike who, um, you know, Black August is a time for us to reflect and um, use discipline as a path forward and really learn and lean into sort of discipline. And that's always for me the biggest sort of lesson or takeaway from Black August. And I think, you know, not to be too much in my Islamic bag today, but a uh, similar message that I always get from Islam is like discipline is the way forward. And I think of people like Sophia Bukhari, you know, who who spoke a lot about discipline and the power of discipline. Right. And so that's kind of the energy I always bring towards the room when it <laughs> when it comes to Black August. Um, but today talking Cuba, you know, um, thinking through what sort of black revolutionary politics mean globally and you know, sort of the black internationalist side of things because revolutionaries like George Jackson um, were deeply, deeply inspired by the anti-colonial and the liberation movements taking place all around them. Um, and were, you know, inherently pan-Africanist in, in their scientific socialist analyses. And so I just try to keep in that same legacy and keep it going basically. Right on. So, so we've been, uh, uh, I, we haven't I don't think we've properly uh, made any announcements or proclamations on this channel or discussions, but we have partnered as a as a channel with with you and your crew extended, uh, which which uh, um, uh, includes, among others, uh, 
uh, uh, uh, Salifu Mack um, and and others in the in the the atmosphere in, the, in these spaces. Uh, but why don't we talk a little bit about that? Um, as I was just starting to look, because always within arm's reach is is you know you know just. So yeah. I was just looking at what Sophia had to had to say about Cuba, but but why don't we talk a little bit about this project? I'm very excited to have partnered with you all in this a little bit to support the the, the this documentary project. Let's talk a little bit about that, and then uh, uh, and then talk a little bit about this overlap of Black August and the Cuban Revolution uh, a little bit more. Yeah, definitely. So um, yeah, I guess this is really the first official public announcement right here on BPM, but. Um, you know, with the, the support of BPM as executive producer, we're going to be this August, uh, I guess this month, actually, um, going to Cuba for two weeks right. and filming a documentary series, specifically looking at um, Black Cuban organizing currently and how Black Cuban organizing with the Red Barrial Afro Descendiente, that's like this neighborhood grassroots project that I work with and that I organize with that's been working in Cuba since around 2010. Um, we're going to look at the work they're doing to sustain communities and, you know, show how they frame themselves as a revolution within the revolution. The Black organizing they're doing is to sustain the revolution, to help strengthen the revolution, and in turn strengthen themselves and their own communities. And so we're actually going to be taking a group from Atlanta, majority Atlanta. Um, I'm helping to organize a delegation with community movement builders. And we're going to be connecting organizers, activists, artists, um, some scholars from the U.S. with some Black revolutionaries in Cuba. And so the documentary is going to look at not just Black Cuban organizing and the discipline and like all the multitude of lessons we can learn from them, but it's going to show, you know, what does material solidarity look like? We're going to take mm. an actual example of a group coming from Atlanta, um, a very passionate, hardworking community organizing, uh, organization. And, um, you know, we're going to show what that international solidarity looks like when they get to Cuba and they meet with their contemporaries, basically just on a different island. And, um, you know, the black Cuban struggle is very unique and very specific, but there's also a lot of overlap and lessons that I think um people can get from it as well and so so yeah that's it's going to be called um well we have a working title right now let me not <laughs> <laughs> let me not you know lie to the people but um we have a working title right now um i'm working with like i said the group the red body out afro descendiente but also in matanzas cuba a group called ogunda masa um and then here in the u.s where we were getting donations from organizations who've been doing radical Cuba solidarity work for decades now. Um, we're getting, you know, support from them. We're also working with Cedar Wolf Media Productions, a dope radical leftist, you know, kind of um, black documentary production studio. So everything we're doing is also, I just love to state this, 100% black dollars, black people on the team, working with black Cubans, um, and I think that's really important. There's no European dollars going into this. And uh, having worked in the media industry now going on about 10 years, that's a, a feat in itself sometimes. And that's hard to do sometimes. And so, you know, we couldn't do it without the support from Black Power Media as well as support from people. Hey, personally, this is exactly like this is this is legit political fantasy coming true. This is what I have wanted this platform to help do so so shout out to us shout out to all the folks who support the channel this is this is the whole point uh um uh to, to help with this kind of work um and be associated with this kind of work so so and and thanks to you and your crew for working with us on that um uh, i i have i have a ton of questions but but one i want to want to remind us that in speaking of the the european dollars in the media industry you you there's a, a, another bout of censorship or or, or mm -hmm. uh, an issue you've come across that I, I didn't want to um forget to mention i also completely forgot to mention that it that at 9 30 this morning uh omali eschatella the chairman of the african people's socialist party is going to join us to talk about the the latest in um 
FBI just FBIing. You know what I mean? You know, they they you know, with all respect to them, they're doing what they were designed to do. Uh, and uh, uh, that just presents another problem for all of us. So uh, we'll talk with him about that. But uh, but the, the focus on the black piece w- from your experience and 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 work with with folks down there, what is sort of the status of this ongoing struggle between race and class, the the the, the state of blackness in Cuba uh, and the Cuban Revolution? Um, you know. Again, why this importance on on making it about Black Cuban? Uh, yeah, initially at least. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, so I think a lot of people in the past few years, specifically, have turned kind of turned their attention to race in Cuba, um, mm. particularly because with these U.S. Uh, NED and CIA-backed counter-revolutionary protests and attempts on the island to try and overthrow the government. Um, black Cubans have kind of been turned into these pawns in the media where they can say black Cubans are against the revolution, black Cubans are experiencing racism and suffering. And this is like a very dominant imperialist narrative taking place, right? But when you go to the island, which itself is a black island, anybody who's been to Cuba will tell you, it, you, you feel as if you're in a, a black, you know, country. Um, the story is extremely different on the ground, right? And so one of the reasons why we can, so I guess I'll back up. There's a, a awesome documentary collective called Belly of the Beast and uh, Liz Oliva, who is the, the host of that series, you know, she put it very beautifully when she said, the blockade itself is a racist entity, mm-hmm right? Like the, mm-hmm. the U.S. blockade against Cuba is itself an act of white supremacy and racism. And in speaking with her and other sort of Black Cuban radicals, um, you can think of it in terms of if you're trying to sustain a revolution and a revolutionary socialist project, and you have the largest empire pretty much in human history, 90 miles away, giving you some of the strongest sanctions um, imaginable, that conquer every aspect of everyday life, the attention of the state by necessity is going to be turned towards that blockade by necessity of survival. You resources, energy, time, attention, by and large, just based off of sheer logic alone, is going to be turned towards that blockade. So then behind that, you then have this sort of uh, prioritization that takes place with, you know, so-called social issues, um, race, gender, sexuality, things that over here in the U.S. may dominate discourse and activism and organizing over there historically have had to take sort of a, at times, a back seat to this larger mm-hmm. blockade, right, that the entire island is feeling at every single second. And I stress that because, like, you can see with your own eyes when you're there, it's taking food out of people's mouths, it's taking medicine from people's hands. Um, any and everything that you can think of is being impacted by this blockade. And so with that in mind, that is the context through which race in Cuba takes place, even as it is like this revolutionary society, right? And so um one of the ways, and this is just to give an example, but one of the ways race is so specific in Cuba, um, especially as it relates to blackness, is when we think of the revolution and the mass export of gusanos, of white Cubans who fled when the revolution took place to Miami. These people were by and large demographically white, conservative, racist, anti-communist. They were losing plantation, plantations, factories, Um, They were no longer allowed to have essentially slave labor working their plantations or being their domestic laborer. Um, They were no longer allowed to have these massive contracts with casinos and resorts that were owned from the West. And so those same people, when they send money back to Cuba and send back remittances, who are they sending money to? They're sending money to their typically their white family members who also wish they could have left probably, but weren't able to leave. And so what's happened over the past 20 to 30 years, and I know that's a lot of context, but I'm trying to talk about, you know, provide it for the people. 
So what happens is those remittances over time, over the past roughly 20 years, has me meant that there's a now a small private sector of white Cubans, especially in like old Havana tourist areas, where they're able to thrive economically in a certain way and be insulated from, um, you know, like economic recession, the pandemic and these kind of things. They're able to thrive and maneuver in such a, in a certain way that black Cubans they don't, black humans are not receiving massive remittances from Miami, right? Like they're not, they don't have this stream of capital. And then of course, which cut, what comes with that is the CIA pumps, you know, nonprofits, <laughs> nonprofits, evangelical churches. Um, a lot of people don't even know this, but U.S. evangelical churches for the past 10 years have led a conservative campaign across Cuba where they're pumping millions and millions of dollars into evangelical churches on the island to try and be anti same sex marriage, anti women's rights, anti progressive politics. So the point is, and, wait, and I'm sorry to cut you off, but let's not also forget the the apps, the yep. social media apps that were deployed, the yep. the rap groups, the the whole hip hop industry that was concocted, or at least a portion of it concocted by the by the U S State Department yep. and their their friends. I mean, they've yeah, it's been a whole like they say full spectrum dominance. But anyway, exactly. sorry, go ahead. No, 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 that's exactly that's exactly what it is. And so you take that whole entire context, and then you look at Black Cubans specifically who benefited arguably the most from the revolution, right? Like in terms of where they were to where they are now being represented at quite literally every single level of their state apparatus from mm. uh, worker workers, communal co-ops to the neighborhood level, to the provincial level, to the regional level. And then across the national level, you have more black people, not just being seen and represented, but actually engaging and owning the political process. But at the same time across society, you have these differences that are starting to gain influence and starting to show based on this Western capital that's being pumped and imported into specific communities, right? And so to understand current race as it relates to Black people in Cuba, you have to understand that context. You have to understand who's getting Miami Cuban money and who's not, basically. Um, and so what the state has done Basically, like the Red Barrio Afro Descendiente and, and a lot of Black Cuban neighborhood and community groups and organizations have pushed the state. And the state, you know, they've said, like, we need specific initiatives that are dealing with these things. These, these differences are, are like, you know, they're becoming a class divide in a, in a society that's supposed to be classless, right? And so mm -hmm. the state, in response, over the last several years has strongly supported the neighborhood at the neighborhood level, these community organizations, providing them resources, places to meet, at times food, um, supporting endeavors like the documentary we'll be doing has the blessing of the state. You know, I wouldn't be doing anything that'd be counter-revolutionary in Cuba. Um, another thing they've been doing is supporting the black private sector and sort of the black businesses to intentionally combat and go against what's sort of being funded by these Miami Cubans. And that's also interesting. We can talk about that another day about the difference between support black businesses in Cuba versus here right, in, under right, capitalism. Right, right, right. <laughs> so yeah, that's just, you know, that's like a background context, but um, essentially the way I look at it and the way I think most black Cubans look at it is the organizing they're doing is to sustain the revolution. It's not mm. to break apart with it. It's not to say the revolution has not helped us. We're over the revolution. It's to to organize its development and progress and continue and keep it going. Right on. Well said. Well put. All right. So I got the links you sent. I know. Uh, um, uh, well, I think you, you have a little bit of a time crunch today. Right. So so uh, there's a lot we want to get to. You're always welcome back. So this is definitely not you know whatever so so let me know what you want me to, to to pull up here and um uh i'm ready when you are uh, okay yeah i mean and, um, I'll add, and 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 yeah yeah sorry go ahead go ahead no no, no. i was gonna say pull up whichever you prefer and i'll just roll with it <laughs> so, oh all right well whatever's easiest I'll just, for you. It, it i'll just go in order here we got uh so th this is this is a, a folder of pictures uh 
let's see. Can you, if I click them, do they just, yeah, there we go. They should just pop up. Yeah. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, buddy. Man, I, again, I've only been to Cuba once uh, uh, for about two weeks. Uh, we covered the whole, not the whole, but I mean, we covered a lot of the island south to north. Um, but uh, I mean, you know, and it, it's just great to be reminded. I love seeing those old cars. They keep them humming. Uh, it's dope. Anyway, sorry. Go ahead. Let me stop. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, no. Nah, I mean, you know, I just wanted to provide some visuals for people because um, when you can see things with your own eyes and see the the vibrant color culture um, mm. of Cuba, it, it hits different when you can, you know, when you can really put you can see what you're talking about. These pictures um, are in Matanzas. I saw Leah, Leah in the chat asking, mm. yes, these pictures are in Matanzas, Cuba. Um, and so I started organizing uh, in Cuba around 2016. The, and I, I, I guess I should translate. So I, I said the word red barrial afrodescendiente. That means the Afrodescendant Neighborhood Network. It's a mm. kind of rough English translation. And essentially what they do is at the Martin Luther King Center in Havana, Cuba, they systematically train activists and organizers as popular educators. So they take like the Paolo Freire concept of popular education, um, you know, which is like a radical way of using sort of community education to organize and agitate and advocate. Um, and so you know, we don't really have an equivalent of that in the U.S. either. Like, we don't have a socialist institution that is quite literally dedicated to just training activists that is also supported mm. by the state. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> <laughs> and if we did have something like that that was supported by the state, it'd be pumping out CIA ops left and right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, the Red Barrio Afrocentiente came about in around 2008. Um when Maritza Lopez and several organizers in Havana were trained by the MLK Center. And then they decided, um, you know, they wanted to form this, this group to work at the neighborhood level to push conversations. And it began just sort of, um, I would say in a, in a sense, like Walter Rodney's groundings, you know, they were going to certain parts of certain neighborhoods where it's mostly black Cubans and they were saying, um, what do you want to learn about? What do you want to talk about? What is most pressing to you in your lives right now? What do you need us as organizers to do? And they would do needs assessments of their neighborhoods before they did any kind of work whatsoever. So they weren't just saying, you know, we're going to go in and start doing this, this, and this, and this. They did these like very methodical needs assessments prior to doing the work that they were doing. And then you know, a lot of what came up was things that are sort of in the cultural sphere of the Cuban world. Um, certain myths, phrases people say that could be described as anti-Black, very interpersonal things came up. And then after doing that work for a few years in the neighborhood, you know, the needs assessments get more and more sophisticated and they start to realize like I was saying earlier about sort of the differences and where private capital is going um, from the West and those kind of things. And so that's how this group got started. And then in 2012, it spread to La Marina, which is actually the photos you're going through now are going, those are in the uh, La Marina neighborhood of Matanzas. And this is one of the most important neighborhoods in all of Cuba, in my opinion. It's home of the Muñequitos de Matanzas. Um, this man in this photo you just passed is Diodato Ramos. He's the director of the world's most famous Roomba group. And what you're seeing him show are the Grammys that he's won. And just as a note, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> he has this massive, massive community altar in his home that people come and bring offerings to and that, you know, they do prayers and all kinds of stuff. And like that takes up all kinds of prominence in his home. And then, like, on the wall in the corner is, like, the Grammys, <laughs> you know? like <laughs> <laughs> The Grammys. Oh, by the way, the right. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. And so, um, so, yeah, I mean, that's just a broad overview. I know that's a lot, but that's sort of where things are at right now. So a lot of the organizing taking place is, like, um, the blockade takes this away from us. The state cannot fill in its role 
in these areas mm. because of the blockade? Where can we fill in? That is essentially the mindset and the frame behind, you know, um, much of the black organizing we see take place in Cuba. I was about to say, is this a BPM cup? I was about to say it looked like a BPM <laughs> cup. Not yet. One but day, yeah. one day. Right, 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 right. <laughs> so, yeah, I know I, I, the, the pictures are are beautiful, and I'm just, I mean, I'm, I'm, I was trying for a minute, like to to actually hear the the rhythms being played in those in in, in the in the photographs of the uh, dance and in the and the music, um, but. Uh, uh, when you hear, do you get questions from people asking, you know, why, why would, why would somebody in the United States feel it necessary to, to document struggle in Cuba or outside the United States? Um, do you get those questions? Uh, and do you have a particular response to that? Like, in other words, how do you bridge this gap? Um, well, even in the, in the context of today's conversation, this gap between um, uh, Black August and the struggle in this part of the hemisphere to uh, the struggle you're documenting and talking about in that part? Yeah, I mean, I get that question probably seven days a week. Um, mm -hmm. And I feel so I you know, there's there's several answers to answers to that. I think one, as a Pan-Africanist, um, I say that and mean that as a verb and as as like an active ideology, not just, you know, like a title that I give myself or that I say. So I think in the Walter Rodney sense of things, Pan-Africanism is about doing and seeing and being engaged. Um, so there's that. But also, you know, the, to me, and, and I would suggest that there's a long legacy of viewing it the same way, the Cuban revol revolution itself should be viewed as an African revolution. Mm. You know, the, the, the Cuban revolution itself, which took place in the Caribbean, um, there is no revolutionary Cuba. There is no independent Cuba, quote unquote, without Africans, without African movement, um, African armed revolt, right? And so, you know, if we're seeing the struggles throughout the African diaspora as congruent with the struggles on the continent in this sort of larger pan-African revolt, then why would we exclude Cuba? Um, you know, even going way back in history to Simone Bolivar in Cuba over 100 mm. years ago, um, Cuba was receiving like arms and fighters and, and information from Haiti, from revolutionary Haiti during the time, right? And, and then, of course, much later, decades later, Cuba was in deep relationships, solidarity, solidarity building, um, across all the anti-colonial struggles across the African continent, right? Um, we know Cuba sent not just like uh, agricultural equipment, medical equipment, doctors and resources, but they also sent literal thousands of Cubans armed to fight in anti-colonial wars in places like Angola. You know, Cuba supported the Grenada Revolution. Cuba was supporting Black American revolutionaries um, and gave refuge to people like Nahanda and Asada Shakur. Um, and then to take it one step further, OPSAW, the Organization of Solidarity with People Around the World, I just butchered that, but Cuba's International Solidarity Organization um, was an extreme you know, leader in the global solidarity movement to get justice for George Jackson. And they actually led in the Spanish speaking world conferences and sort of movements and campaigns um, to bring attention to, to George Jackson being slaughtered in his jail cell, right? And so to me, the connection between Black August and Cuba is one, we as Black people, uh, we're African people first and foremost, and this is an African revolution. And so in the same way that we would look to the anti-colonial struggles you know, led by Lumumba or Sankara, um, Nkrumah, you know, all of these people across the continent, we should also be looking at Cuba in the same vein. I mean, the same could be said, and I know Erica is in the chat and will agree, uh, about Nicaragua and Venezuela. These are, they, these are African liberation struggles at the end of the day. Um, and, and George Jackson himself 
was deeply inspired, you know, by, and, and many revolutionaries of his time were inspired by these revolts, revolutions, and anti-colonial struggles taking place around them, from Cuba to the Congo to Vietnam, right, to right here taking place in places like Chicago, Atlanta, New York, um, all across the West Coast, very fierce struggles that took place. And so, yeah, that's, you know, that's... So this is the brother, my bad, I'm sorry, this is the brother here that you're talking about in the article that you sent me uh, that I I only got a chance to skim a little bit, right? Um, Wearing a 100% Negro shirt. Um, Yes. uh, And is that article published already? Is it it on Community Movement Builders already, or is it... um, So I think the article is supposed to go up sometime today. Um, Okay. Can I, t- I can actually talk about the article a little bit because I, it's sure, please I got, go ahead. I got some tea on that. It's a little bit of a headache. Okay, um, nice. Right on. I like to air some people out. But <laughs> uh, yeah, let's do, yeah, let's go. <laughs> um, I ain't talking my language. Hold up, hold up, hold up, Dev. <laughs> hold up. I got something for that. Hold up, hold up, hold up, Dev. Hold up. Let's let, let me let me get you a little transition. Hold up. I was supposed to battle, but you were scared. Oh. But since- Man, shout out to Dr. Hate that, that encouraged me to make that <laughs> math hopper in the building. Yeah, anyway, anyway, <laughs> sorry about that. I, I got a little excited. You talk about air people out. I got excited. Anyway, as please, a resident, as a resident hater, you know, I'm very much <laughs> here for the energy. <laughs> yes. Um, yes. So two now, two summers ago, um, I was working with a, a documentary place people might know called Redfish, Redfish Media. They make a lot of communists. I do it with very strong air quotes um, content. You ever heard of them? I have. In fact, they con- somebody from them contacted me and Kali Akuno a couple of years ago, and I and was supp- I, I th- wanted. I don't know. It was something that they wanted us to do. It never it never materialized. Uh, but that's that's where I first came in into awareness of them. But anyway, please go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, so they probably did contact you. It might have been me who contacted you. I worked there for like five or six months. Oh, okay. Um, I, you know, they, but they produce documentaries, um, new style documentaries about organizing and activism around the world. They're openly communist. Um, but they also tend to be one of the most exploited companies I've, exploitative companies I have ever worked for in my entire 10 years working in media. And um, they hired me to do a docu-series on Walter Rodney's How Europe Underdeveloped Africa, and then um, produced it almost all the way to completion. And then I was like, contract terminated. Uh, You know, they didn't want to speak to me no more, all kinds of stuff. But one of the ideas that I had gave to them was that I go to Cuba and use sort of the organizing I'm doing there, and we do a documentary specifically about that man, Kimbo, with the 100% Negro shirt that you showed, and so just literally like a profile of his revolutionary life. They loved the idea, of course, and essentially wanted to, you know, run with it. I ended ties with them, and then I just had sat on this idea for a while. So then in April of this year, there was a culmination of like several years of work that Kimbo had been putting into his neighborhood where they built an Afro parque, like an African park in the La Marina neighborhood. The La Marina neighborhood is both the poorest and the blackest neighborhood in Matanzas. And at the same time, it has some of the longest African history and culture. And so it's a very important neighborhood. So they built this park to honor their African heritage. They pulled together a a community brigade of builders from the community to build this park. They did this massive sweeping um, community, sort of that right there that's on the screen, um, social cartography, where they felt as if the local government was doing was not doing a good enough job of preserving their neighborhood's history in sort of the overall state history. So they decided to do it themselves and do this social cartography where they went door to door to door to door to literally every single person. 
They also had huge forums where people would come, um, you know, and, and, and talk. And so the end result of that, I was like, I have to do some kind of reporting on this. Like, this has been years of work. I was supposed to do it for Redfish. I was supposed to do it for one other person. And so I pitched this article to this place called the Sunday Long Read. I had never heard of them before. I just knew they paid a dollar a word. <laughs> and in the writing industry, you're lucky to get more than $200 for an article nowadays. And I'm a long-winded ass person. So I knew I, was <laughs> I had a lot to write about this. You know, I'm just being transparent. Don't know if I give a dollar per word no more. And so I was going to say that sounds high. Hey, but yeah, I'm here for it. Good and for so, you. Right. Yeah. And so the article focuses on the backstory of um, sort of who Kimbo is, how he went from being what he calls in his words, like a player and a street thug or a pimp. Um, to getting involved with this community baseball team. And from that point forward, because spending a life organizing to sustain his neighborhood and to sustain sort of the revolution, African revolution of Cuba. That's how he puts it. So, th so that's what the article looks at. Of course, inside of that, there's indictments of the U.S. blockade and U.S. Mm -hmm. imperialism. Um, how the blockade impacts not just Black Cubans, but Black Americans wanting to go and connect with Cuba and learn about, um, you know, the culture there, the history, all that. I went back and forth in edits over this piece since April. So since April, for those of you who've never written a piece for public, when you submit the draft, usually one or two editors will go through on a Google Doc or something and they're going to give you just all kinds of edits. Change this, change that, reword this. Can you add this, take away this? Um, there's great editors and there's bad editors. They took political issue with me using words like imperialist. Where I use the word blockade, they wanted me to use the word embargo. And I had to explain, we don't do that. And <laughs> this is why. They wanted me to spend several paragraphs talking about explaining this, explaining a lot that to me should either be assumed or if you don't know, you can Google search it. You know what I mean? Like I, I go through like painstaking detail of explaining concepts. And so um, the article was supposed to be out several months ago and I was supposed to write two versions of this article, the narrative version, and then a straightforward sort of more just journalistic reported version of the events that was gonna go to grassroots thinking literally an hour before it was finally supposed to be published, I got this email saying, hey, Dev, I have bad news for you. This piece, you know, due to some political differences with the other editors, uh, we're not able to publish the piece. And this is, a, I traveled to do this report. You know, I went through over like six hours of audio interviews. I'm reading in Spanish and English and translating entire documents. Um, and then going back and forth with these editors. And then an hour before, basically, they're just like, yeah, we can't do this. I and does this mean no publish, no pay? So they had already paid me um, partial for the piece. So, you know. Mm -hmm. Had I worked on all this for no pay, I would have made a very, very, very big deal about it. I'm not going to front. <laughs> I, would have, I would have made a huge deal about it. Um, but it just shows the kind of landscape we're in and sort of a media environment we're in that they would be willing to pay a writer for the piece and kill it and just let, them, let me take the money than to put this piece out that's pro-Cuba and anti-U.S. blockade. And of course, you know, when asking for more details and stuff, the only answer I got was that not all of our editors are on the same page politically and that they don't all, you know, whatever. Um, and this isn't the first time with Cuba related stuff. I either struggle to get an article published or the editing process comes along and they want me to add a paragraph about how evil the Cuban government is. And I refuse to. And then the article gets dropped. That's happened to me at least three times, you know, so it's yeah yeah i can i i have only well i've only experienced something like that in the academic context with academic journals where uh 
um, Eric King Watts. That's the brother's name. Boy, oh boy. That dude, boy, he killed a piece that that, that we did because he said uh, he didn't like my 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 argument around uh, my connection of uh, internal colonialism and this and the case of Mumia Abu Jamal. That was mm. what his that was what the argument was. Mm. Um and uh uh yeah and then i saw that dude popping up in hip-hop studies and i and, and i was just like yeah this is this is very typical so yeah i'm sorry to hear that but um it is unfortunately consistent with you know yeah uh, yeah the way things are um with and media say, and, and empire yeah go ahead sorry and mm-hmm. i'll say i saw um i think it was leah in the chat asked if i could give you know explain a little bit of context for matanzas because the name means massacre and anyone who Googles Matanzas is probably very confused. Um, but the when the Spanish were colonizing the island, Matanzas is a very important area because on, on the west side of the island, I had to do my geography in my head for a second. <laughs> on the west <laughs> side of the island, Matanzas was essentially the number one uh, port through which African slaves were coming through, right? Mm, and mm. it's like open to the west in a sense. And then on the east side, the equivalent would be Santiago de Cuba. So in Matanzas, there, that's why there's such a deeply entrenched African history and practice and tradition in Matanzas, because it was like the hot spot on the west side for enslaved Africans. But prior to that, when the Spanish were um, essentially slaughtering the natives that were already there in order to colonize the island, there's a famous story in which a some I would say like semi enslaved um, native women were taking some Spaniards across the water on boats, and they famously tipped the boats over, you know, effectively putting all the Spaniards in the water, to which the natives then massacred and slaughtered them in the water, and the native women, you know, swam to the shore and cared about their business. And this is a very famous story in the origins of the city of Matanzas. And that's actually, they say Matanzas was founded on that massacre. And so that's where that name comes from. I love it. Yeah, I love it. Um, Did you want, so I, I, oh, wait a minute, what happened to it? Hold on. Did you want to play, because there was more you sent, um, and there was a video in the, in the, in the um in the google drive in the google in this in this set of photos i know there was another video also did oh yeah yeah uh, you can uh, you you can play that and i can talk about that a bit all right sure 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 there we go that's what i'm talking about fixing the shoes in the middle of it. (laughs) 
So, I mean, if no disrespect to the specifics, but I'm like, if you fade out the music, they could be anywhere. Like the, the two dancing could be anywhere. The point about Pan-Africanism. I, I mean, look, 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 look. I didn't even I didn't even plan that pop lock drop. I mean, that's everywhere. Exactly. I mean, anyway, that that was yeah. that was hot. Yeah, man. And shout yeah. out to the sound. How did you get that sound so good? I'm gonna be honest. Um, I record that on my cell phone. So, <laughs> are you serious? Yeah. Hey. I, um, to, Shout um, out to the cell phones. Yeah. To to give some context, that was rumba and rumba music. Uh, the music, the instruments, the dance is directly descendant from West Africa, brought to Cuba by enslaved Africans and kept alive in Cuba almost more than anywhere else in the world. Um, and rumba is extremely, extremely, extremely important for Black Cubans. It is not just music. It's not just something to attract tourists. Um, it's something that they view it as part of their African identity, right? Like, you know, there's a lot of people here in the U.S. who say, like, we need to identify with our African identity because the African identity itself is like a is unifying. And for community organizing, you need you need unification, you need different points of unity. And so through Roomba, they connect with this African identity, they call themselves Africans in Cuba, and they're able to have this sort of unified front. And Roomba plays like a really big, um, a really, really big role in that, you know what I mean? And like you said, these dances are very ancestral, like they look very similar to what people here in the US do. You could look at like Congo Kinshasa and see people doing the same dances across uh, Trinidad. Like, um, and on top of that, it just looks fine. You know what I mean? Like they just be killing it. <laughs> they they do. I, I was someone... at the Go Go last. Well, well now last year already because the last time I went was for my birthday, and it was the same. Just older. The people were older, but doing <laughs> the same basic steps. Maybe yeah. a little slower, but it was yeah. the same basic anyway. Man. Yeah, you know, the um, and the group that we saw performing that was the Muñequitos de Matanzas, the one we were talking mm. about earlier. And what so they've actually been around since 1957. And what they do is they train every few years a new generation of dancers, um, and a new generation of like you know, people playing instruments, singing. They just so it's like the children of the neighborhood inherit it and keep it going. And so, those dancers that you saw, um, five years ago were literal teenagers who were still learning how to like hold down the dance and you know what I mean and they have the teenagers teach the little kids the little kids teach the babies like they have like a system and structure around it too and everyone was out in that video because they were celebrating the induction of the Afro Parque so everyone was mm -hmm. coming out in the neighborhood and I mean everyone was out in the neighborhood to celebrate um, this African park being built and the Muñequitos performed, a lot of local rappers performed. But I would say we don't really have an equivalent of that in the US in terms of like cultural, I, cultural organizing at the neighborhood level that's also recognized nationally and it's all done through Roomba. I just don't think we, I can point to maybe early hip hop back in the North, back in the day, but like, you know, nowadays, I don't know that I can point to a, uh, an example of that. I can't think of one. Uh, or maybe yeah, that's, that's a good point. Yeah, I would say ballroom culture might be the perfect example of a working class black okay. cultural phenomenon. Right, 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 right. Okay. Um, I did want to ask. So, so earlier we saw a picture. You talked about the uh, the Dr. King Center that they have there. We saw the pictures. Uh, so I asked you about the the view from the United States 
uh, and the question of of supporting black struggle elsewhere as opposed to here uh is is their establishment of a center named after king and the work they're doing there a reflection of how they view the struggle going back here i mean obviously beyond just the 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 historical support for uh nahanda abiyadun rest in power and asada shakur uh in that kind of 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 or that point of struggle is 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 in other words, I'm asking: To what extent do you see the 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 solidarity reflecting back this way, and and what is the image of the, of the black struggle in the United States there at this point? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Um, so the MLK Center was opened several decades ago in Havana, and it got its name because they were so deeply inspired by MLK's radical peace politics, um, you know, and sort of the vein of maybe W.E.B. Du Bois, this idea that um, peace itself can be advocated for as like a political line, um, mm. not sort of the absence of violence or the absence of political conflict, but peace itself as both a, both a goal and a political format. Um, and they were influenced by, well, I should back up. The center was started by radical pastors in Cuba who were interested in the way that not just his peace politics, but the way that he used his Christianity and his spirituality as well, sort of in his messaging and in his organizing and what MLK did. And so they were inspired by, you know, not just him as a figure, but they read his works. Some of them translated his works to Spanish for the very first time. Um, and they, they also look at MLK himself as a Pan-Africanist, which I think you on your show have talked about before, how we never you know, view MLK's larger international Black politics. We never take those into consideration whatsoever. Um, and so that, that is actually kind of the foundation for how they engage with that, the, the diaspora at large. And so they, they look at... Um, like what we're doing here in the US, for example, like black movement in the US, they look at it as an extension of that MLK legacy. They also honor a lot of other people like Malcolm X. Malcolm X is very, very huge in Cuba. If you say Equis, which is the Spanish word for X, people know you're talking about Malcolm X. That's how he they go by he goes by there, Equis. Um that's but yeah, dope. yeah, the solidarity goes both <laughs> ways. Like whenever I take groups to Cuba to meet with the black organizers there, the people from the U.S. are never prepared because I always tell them they want to know what you're doing here. They want to know mm -hmm. what is working and what's not working for you with your struggle. They want to know where you're at politically here in the U.S., what you've been doing. They're just as eager to learn from us and about us as we are to learn from about them. Um, and the other, the last thing I'll say, the, dope, the really dope thing about the MLK Center, um, they have this massive, well, not massive, but they have this big courtyard that um, basically whenever there's like a revolutionary group or movement that comes through Cuba, whether it's the PSUV from Venezuela, uh, the landless workers of Brazil, groups from Angola, that communist group of Nigeria, they, they usually come through the MLK Center, either for like an event, you know, or just literally just to come to the space and study and meet with some of the people there. Um, and you go into this courtyard and you can, they hang flags. So this courtyard has flags of every workers movement around the world who has came through the MLK Center. And you have flags, you know, you have like the Bolivian, the rainbow indigenous uh, Bolivians people's flag you have like landless workers of Brazil. I mean, it's just like a very astounding place to be in and contrasted with all those flags on the wall across from it is this huge mural of MLK looking very powerful, you know? And so it's just a powerful space to be in knowing that all these other revolutionary organizers and activists and, and groups and organizations and parties have came through there as well. Right on. So listen, uh, obviously we could go on for, for days. What What is your time like again? How much do you need to dip now? Um, um, 
I gotta you just I gotta clock into my job now, but I I gotta leave in like maybe fifteen ish minutes. I can because the only other well I don't know if we have time to 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 get into it now, uh, but I know that there was um some some criticism. I don't know how 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 appropriate that word is, but you you had some thoughts about our discussion the other day about not only I think LGBTQ rappers, but the discussion in general. Um. Mm. And I, if, if you have, if you think there's enough time to at least lay some of that out, I'm happy to have you do that here now, or obviously you're always welcome back to do that again another time. Um, or if there's something else you wanted to make sure we got to regarding this project, um, you know, I just please let me know what you want to do. Yeah, I mean, um, in the interest of time, I know, you know, it's that's we could I could fill a whole hour or two um, sure. on that alone. Sure. But no, I mean, I think that, you know, when we talk about rappers and hip hop, um, one, I think there's a tendency to be very North centric and very like mm. sort of New York, Jersey, Philly, like that whole area. But the South also has a huge hip hop tradition. And I think, you know, in part, it's just because of who's on BPM, <laughs> a lot of up north type of cats, you know what I mean? But so I do want to say that, too. I'm, I'm right, because even the people in the south all came from up north. Yeah, to an extent. Like, it, to it, an extent. It, well, I'm talking about in terms of BPM, like oh, Kalanji, oh, yeah, Kamau, yeah, yeah. Ear Doctor, they're all in the south, but they all right. come from up north. So, right. Just yeah. To, yeah. Yeah. But in terms of, um, you know, TLGBQ rappers, I think. Uh, I just asked that question in the chat a week or two ago when y'all were talking about hip hop and top fives and all that. And um, it's just because I noticed when all of these conversations are taking place, there's usually not a single TLGBQ rapper on, on the list whatsoever. As, or people don't even know, can't even name a single one. And I'm not saying that folks should like intentionally go and seek these people out because of their identity. Like that's the opposite of what I'm saying. I'm saying like there's a natural exclusion that takes place that people honestly don't even realize, you know what I mean? Um, and then, so I just, I really was just genuinely curious just asking that in the chat, wasn't trying to start anything. I know the chat <laughs> descends the into chat. madness real easily. <laughs> and, um, but then when we think about, so so when Ear Doctor, you know, he's like, oh, I don't listen to rappers because of their identity. I listen to them because they make dope music. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we're recognizing when it's a woman rapper, right? We're like, oh, one of my top woman MCs or, oh, you don't got no women on your list. And so it's not, you know, when there's like a community inside of this cultural form of hip hop that has been sort of like maybe historically, um, overlooked historically excluded devalued even i would say you know as was the case with women for many years i would argue still is the case despite the popularity of a certain kind of woman artist in hip-hop mm, mm. um it it makes sense to highlight or to even sort of go that extra route of effort to include them or to at least be cognizant of the art that they're creating does that make sense it does. It does. So one question I have is to what extent is the exclusion of LGBTQ rappers a product of the uh, reactionary views of people in the community or versus the the uh, which is usually my approach, the the uh, the industry not promoting, supporting encouraging to what extent is that because i admit of the list that you emailed me a list uh, uh um and i only i've only gotten to cakes so far so i and 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 when i hear cakes well, i forget the full name um but it's it sounds other than the other than when i have to admit i had to it, it took me a sec i had to i had to go through an adjustment to you know when when the sexual references are are to another man it did kept, it did take me a second to be like okay but other than that the beat the flow everything sounded as good as everything else i mean it sounded so like i don't so on the or i well for i would say is as, as 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 it sounds the same i don't know if i consider that good i'm not i'm a little old for this generation i'm a little <laughs> bit and i'm and i'm also becoming i gotta admit too i'm also becoming like 
like stereotypically conservative in my old age. I don't want to see any sex in movies anymore. I, I don't want to see like nudity anymore. I don't want to like anyway. So yeah. I'm saying all that to say, what would what, what? Why is it is cakes a promoted like? Does he have a, a contract? Like, is is this like a promoted artist? Is that part of the problem, or or you know, anyway? Yeah, no, I get your question definitely. Um, so I think that it's I think two things can be true at one time. I think that we can acknowledge within our community there are reactionary views towards the TLGBQ community that mm -hmm. influences and impacts the kind of music people will listen to. Um, you know, I know this is just, just I know men who have told me who I'm friends with or my family who are like, you know, I'm never I don't listen to female rappers. That's gay. Right. Or stuff like that. So even even just in conversation, you can you can gleam a lot of these sort of reactionary tendencies around gender and sexuality. Um, but as far as from the music industry, the music industry is much more interested in promoting an artist like Lil Nas X or Saucy Santana who is much more pro uh, marketable, profitable, who, who engages with their culture in ways that are easily commodifiable as well. Mm. Um, you know, when you're listening to Cakes the Killer, who to me is one of the hardest MCs out right now, he, he, he raps amazing. Um, he's not referencing brand names that he's not, he's not, he's clearly not trying to attract TikTok virality. He's not trying to get a, a brand endorsement. He's not like flashing products in the camera during the music videos. Um, and dozens and dozens of these artists are not even operating in, in, under the assumption that a record label would ever even pick them up in the first place. You know what I mean? Mm. And so I think in the same way- But what about that? But I, Dev, I thought, I thought we were in the, 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 the takeover. I thought- I thought the trans and the gay community was taking everything over and imposing queer theory and, hey. and everything. Like, why wouldn't they be, why wouldn't Cakes be like the, the new Kendrick from their perspective then? What's up? Yeah, I mean, look, you, your guess is as good as mine. You know, I mean, when, when you have someone who is sort of has an authentic tie to a community, mm. is creating music that does not sound like what's on the radio and that in my opinion is in many regards sort of pushing the envelope forward um and that's just i'm talking like pure talent terms but then in terms of like your ability to be commodified like mm. so essentially in order like do you have a de demonstrate demonstrable past of engaging with brands of engaging in the digital world in a certain way you know are you you can gauge how open someone is to selling out quite literally just based on their, their musical precedent. And so a lot of these artists, they don't even have that option. There's no mainstream respectable version of that artist that exists currently. Um, and I think that's a large part of it, you know, like also when we, even when we think of this current trend of like, you know, the number one thing in hip hop you can get right now is a record deal. And it's, you, you wrote about mm. that in your book, of course, very well, but that's been the trend for several years now. That already in and of, in and of itself excludes massive amounts of people. You know what I mean? Like massive amounts of people who we know are never about to get signed by no deal. Of course, we also need to call into question why rappers would even want a record deal in the first place and why that has become the golden standard under this capitalist music industry. Um, and then also the last point I'll make too, just for some little current news relevance, you know, look at what's happening with Beyonce and Drake. And I, you know, Beyonce herself being a billionaire capitalist, all these things, you suddenly have this big interest in TLGBQ culture, whether that's house music, ballroom music, um, doing voice samples of people like T.S. Madison and MC Deborah. Like these are legends and icons who you're plastering your album with when being trans or non-binary is not a trend. We're living under mm. material conditions, mm. quite literally with our backs against the walls. People we're homeless at higher rates, incarcerated at higher rates. Right. And so um, what they're looking at is with the rise of this sort of mainstream version and mainstreaming of like black gay culture 
through venues like RuPaul's Drag Race and Legendary, you have, in my opinion, one of the last standing Black genres in the U.S. that has not been completely corporatized and commodified, that is still largely working class Black people, right? Like, when you look at the music that they play in ballroom, it's usually created, enjoyed, and sustained by working class Black individuals. You now have these capitalists who see a new avenue of the market that they can corner off and that they can exploit and that they can eventually dominate. Beyonce has no authentic fucking claims to the Black gay community. I don't care if her uncle was gay or something like that. You have no authentic claim to this music, no authentic claim to this you know what I mean? I, and her I'll, fan base, that's probably what she would say, right? Her fan base gives her an authentic connection, that they that it includes some from, from those communities, right? Maybe? Yeah, but, you know, know, Nina Simone had a massive following in Sweden. Mm. You didn't see her making, like, Swedish opera music. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> these jazz artists. You and she just, quietly wanted to. She said she quietly wished she could do more European classical music, but she I'm felt sure compelled she, to not do that. She felt like she yeah. couldn't. And but that's funny. That's funny. Yeah. I mean, you were just talking about you were talking about last week and how you know um, a lot of these jazz artists have to go over to Europe to make yeah. to make their money, right? Because jazz at one point was a predominantly working class, as working class as it could get. One would argue, one could argue, um, musical genre, black musical genre, and not just genre but cultural phenomenon that was yeah. over time essentially bossed and bought it was corporatized commodified people in the u.s equate jazz with elevator music when we know that it's like the complete opposite and i think what we're seeing right now is beyonce and them are looking at gay music and gay culture black gay stuff specifically and they're like oh this is a new market for me to corner and exploit drake did it tiana taylor did it like it's these are these are corporate capitalists who are signed to these deals Sony owns Beyonce, basically. They have hundreds of people working for them around the clock, 24-7, and they're scanning the internet. And this is what they do. This is what these big artists do because this is how the colonial capitalist model of the music industry works. Uh, look, Dev, uh, I appreciate you. I know I know you, you got to go. Uh, in, in fact, one of the stories I'm going to use as a, as a holdover before O'Malley shows up is, is referencing the, the, the Beyonce Kaylee story where I saw she got into something with, with Drake despite Me Too protecting her album or something like Anyway, whatever. So Yeah, yeah. So, you, need to, you need to have me and Erica back on to talk about Kaylee and Beyonce because we... Um... We had a lot to say on Discord about it <laughs> the other day. Oh, really? Well, I mean... Let's work it out. I mean, I'll I'll tee it up today, and then and then whenever you whenever you all are ready, let's do it. Let me cool. know. Let's get in the email and set that up. I, I'm very interested in that, actually. So sounds good to me. All right, well, Dev Springer, thank you very much. Appreciate your work. Thank you for the collaboration and and coming through this morning. And I look forward to the next uh, your next visit and and your continued good work, man. P uh, uh, you know, appreciate you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate you. And I appreciate everything y'all do with Black Power Media. I be watching the morning show every morning. That's my morning news. You know, I get my news from y'all. Um, shout out to Jackie Luke Mon. I'm a Jackie Luke Mon stan. Jackie, if you're listening, <laughs> I love you. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and we everyone. We need t-shirts. We need some Jackie stan t-shirts. Yeah, and everyone be on the lookout in the next few months for some footage from this Cuba documentary and more about yeah, right that. On. And so, yeah, peace. Thank you, Dev. Take good care now. All right, everybody, let's keep it moving here. Uh, a, a, a quick a, a quick break, and then we'll come back. I'll tee up that topic uh, since I had looked into it a little bit, and then we'll come back uh, and, and uh, get ready for uh, a visit from Chairman Omale, Omali Yeshitela. Don't go anywhere right back here. Quick second, I mix what I like. I mix what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like. So uh, please, if you haven't already, um, make sure that you and click all the bells and notifications. Uh, um, I'm not, 
I got a, a whole bunch of uh, comments and criticisms ready for the next installment of Answering Critics. So stay tuned. It might even come later today. Um, but uh, uh, so definitely stay around for that and uh, make sure you're ready for the Remix Morning Show all week this week. And then uh, I will be back on Friday with, with Geechee and Brother Diallo um, at the end of the week. Um, I did look, I did, wait, a couple a couple comments here real quick. Um, Baba Balagoon, uh, welcome to finally becoming a member. Appreciate you doing that. Everybody else who who is so capable should do that. Yes, yeah, Omali Yeshitela is from the Black is Back Coalition formed uh i want to say right after the election of barack obama uh as a as a a, a pan-african black radical response to that election uh and yes so steph life you just were a little early your comment came at 8 14 this morning so i hope you're still here because yes we are uh i don't know the context of this comment from back earlier but i just saw imam jamil alameen and any reference uh to, to to that brother elder political prisoner is on point i don't know about belly of the beast so i got to catch up to that uh i don't know what this is in reference to but i just i guess i just clipped it because it was a compliment to me uh and yeah i do so that actually you know that actually was a uh, Dr. Burroughs and I had written this article that that was about Mumia, about internal colonialism, and da da da, and and that was the cr that was the crux of the argument that Watts was saying was the problem. He he literally said that 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 not enough had been done, and we went back and forth on a number uh, like a couple of rounds, and he he kept concluding that I had not done enough to demonstrate the value of an internal colonial thesis, even as I showed given that Mumia was the context, how Mumia used that in his own work. So I was like, and I, can, and I said to him, you don't have to agree for it to be a publishable article. It does, it's, your agreement is not what peer review means. <laughs> that's, not, that's not what peer review means. Anyway. Uh, so yeah, I will never forget that. And there's a whole bunch of little trifling things like that in just in my little career. So, um, that's it. That was why I clipped this, this comment here from be more cool. It different. It, 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 that's the, it, if you disagree, write an article, disagree with it. The, the argument should have been, does it, is it appropriate to this journal? It absolutely was. Is it, uh, uh, does it reach academic standards? Does it cover the literature? Does it, does it appropriately refer to it? All of those things. That's what, that's what it was about. And that's, that's right. I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I will be lucid and logical until the last breath. You better believe it. Uh, and that's what, and hate and, and medicinal support is what's going to keep me there. Uh, communists can't be in aesthetics. I agree. They shine light on issues which don't normally hear, but communists should have principles. Don't need to be saints, but need principles. I don't remember the context of this, but Emma, this is exactly right. There's not enough emphasis on principles in our struggle. And having good politics is not, <laughs> is not a replacement for an absence of, of principles. Thank you, like a final boss for the super chat unrelated, but could Geechee, could you Geechee and Diallo have the Afro vegan society on a future broadcast? I don't see why not. I'm not familiar with them. So please send an email, uh, reach out to us and help, help us with some, 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 yeah, I don't have, I certainly not opposed to that. And thank you for the super chat. Uh, thank you, Coco. Appreciate that. You dag all right. You dag all right. Grandpops was trifling. All right, so check this out real quick. So I did look into this this story because I am uh, um, uh, constantly, I don't stay up to date on the music as much as I used to, but I do like to try to track some of the politics in the music industry because not only for my classroom work, and to try to be aware of what students are talking about on some level, but also just because I like to try to monitor what's shaping the um, 
the public sphere, the political context of the public sphere around it. So I think this is this will be great. And when we get Dev and Erica on to, to finish this discussion, I'm sure it'll be even better. So it was brought to my attention that on her new album, uh, Beyonce, as the title of this article says, could have made a phone call to deal with the controversy around sampling um, uh, a Kaylee's track. And Kaylee's went went public uh, and basically said that. Um, let me find my note here. Uh, she basically said that without contacting her, the ongoing and historical legacy of black exploitation of particular of, of exploitation, particularly of black women in the music business. Uh, has been extended by Beyonce's behavior of not reaching out, contacting her, uh, that is Kaylee's, about the the sampling of um, one of her songs. I believe it's Milkshake was the sampled song. But what it, you know, re-exposed is that as Kaylee's pointed out, it wasn't so much that in, in other words, it's not all Beyonce's fault was Kaylee's point. It wasn't that Beyonce is the ultimate problem here, but it was that Beyonce, given her stature, her position, being a black woman in the music business, a billionaire at the top of the game, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, she could have done more to address that legacy and to correct it. Part of the response of the defense from Beyonce and her community was that she listed Kaylee's, uh, you know, credited her which was thought by some mistakenly to not only give Kaylee's credit, but some financial remuneration for use of the song. But what was again exposed through uh, that legacy of exploitation of, of, of black artists and black women in particular is that Kaylee's had already been prior in her first two albums ripped off by Pharrell and the Neptunes through shady contract dealings, which listed specifically listed Kaylee's only as a performer, not a songwriter, not a, a, well, not a songwriter, just the performer, which meant that she had a very limited amount of royalties available to her. And in this most recent abuse from, or, or, or uh, as Kaylee's called it, theft from of Beyonce, by Beyonce of Kaylee's work, even listing her in, in the credits as 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 the author of that sampled song or the 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 performer of that sampled song does not make Kaylee any money because the performer doesn't make royalties off of that. Pharrell and Neptunes get money off of that, so Kaylee is not getting paid and is not having the issue in the or the fact of her exploitation dealt with. So even as this article says. Beyonce was apparently meticulous in checking, putting her, all of her collaborators through Me Too checks to make sure that there were no issues with, with uh, collaborations with people who had uh, abused women, despite apparently Drake getting on the album, uh, um, having been accused of sexual and felony assault in 2020. I didn't know about that. I didn't hear about any of that. And that's very interesting. Um, but he made it on the album. Uh, um but in all of that checking, why wasn't there, as this article raises in question, why wasn't there any check of the fact that that the song Milkshake, Milkshake was being uh, used and uh, had already been a product of the exploitation of Kaylee's by Pharrell and the Neptunes? All right. I'm going to stop there. I see the chairman has showed up uh, a couple minutes early. So let's honor that 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 timeliness and get to something a little more substantive than this. Although I will just say that ultimately, I do think this is a deep issue because it, it speaks about the, the it, it exposes the function of media within a colony and the need of not only the exploitation, but assuring that the only the acceptable forms of popularity will be made clear. So whether she wanted to or not, I would argue Beyonce is not in a position to actually confront that that structure. Otherwise, she would not maintain herself where she is and, and is 
uh, and has gotten to. All right, so let's stop there, uh, take a quick break and come back and get to something a little more substantive with Omali Yeshitela. Don't go anywhere. I mix what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like. All right, good people. Chairman Omali Yeshitela of the African People's Socialist Party, the Uhuru Movement, a uh, longtime activist and struggler is, uh, 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 I believe, still chairman of the Black is Back Coalition. Still That's chair right. of the Black is Back. Uh, right on. So good to see you again. Welcome uh, back to the platform. It's been a minute, but it's, uh, uh, once upon a time you have been here. It's good to see you again. What is the latest? What is what have you done again, <laughs> brother? Yes, you tell her. What have you done again to get yourselves, uh, unfortunately, targeted once more by the state? Uh, uh, with the claim that you have been acting as a Russian asset or pawn of some kind. But but please catch us up and let us know what's been going on. Uh, and again, welcome. Well, thank you so much, Comrade John. The first thing I want to say is that I really appreciate being able to have this discussion with you. And while I did not hear uh, uh, the discussion that you've just had, I, I do appreciate the tail end that you were talking about uh, the media within the colony and how uh, it is absolutely necessary for the colonizer, for the oppressed uh, to be able to control the narrative that explains uh, the relationship that the colonized has with the colonizer. And that's what's happening. The United States government, um, five o'clock in the morning, uh, Friday, attacked my house in St. Louis. Um, they came to the house, blocked the streets with an armored vehicle in front of my house, uh, yelled on loudspeakers uh, that people who were in the house had come out with our hands up uh, and, and started ex exploding flashbang bang grenades all over the place, going over and over and over again. Uh, so we didn't know what was happening. And they said, this is the FBI, FBI, come out with your hands up, with nothing in your hands and what have you. So I, I, I felt like uh, there's a good possibility that they were gonna kill the people in the house, and, you know, well, me. And uh, so I, I, my wife and I were sitting up because you know, we're up early in the morning. Uh, they came and got Fred, if you remember, at four o'clock in the morning in 1969. So uh, they came a little later uh, at five o'clock here. And so they attacked um, the house. I came out of the house, uh, first because if they if they were going to shoot or anything like that i didn't want my wife to be in the initial uh, line of fire and i uh, asked her to start calling uh, people uh, to let them know what was going on uh, i was to learn later that every effort she made to call someone uh, uh, failed because the government had jammed our, our phones and not just the phones in this house but contacts that we had around uh, around the country. So we couldn't communicate with anybody. I, I went out of the house. Uh, it's still dark at five o'clock in the morning. And I see the armored vehicle and uh, we're surrounded by thugs in, in uh, tactical gear. Uh, and when I walk out the door, uh, bouncing off my chest, uh, 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 were these uh, uh, laser targeting uh, dots all over my chest. So uh, so yeah, I'm assuming that they're gonna kill now. <clears throat> I, I get downstairs, hands up, come this direction. My wife, then she follows me down the stairs and she would say later that when she was on the way downstairs, a drone passed her, almost hit her in the face going up the stairs into the house. So um, when, when I get downstairs, uh, come this way, come this way, bright lights in my face and what have you. And I see these uh, camouflaged, uh, uh, tired uh, thugs with, uh, with uh, armored vest on. And, uh, and, the, and the flashbang grenades are still going off uh, all around the place. And, you know, uh, you know the, neighbor, in the, the neighbors, of course, are being awakened and... Uh, and I imagine being terrorized uh, by what has happened. The the FBI they've occupied the porch on the next to the on the, the house next to me. They put tape over the um, the video camera, 
you know, the, that that people can look down when somebody rings the bell, they put tape over it so nobody can see what they're doing. They won't mean us. I get down, what's going on? They use the zip ties, they handcuff, um, they cuff me in the back. My wife comes down, they put cuffs on her. They put actual handcuffs on her. And uh, we're standing there and they're telling us to sit on the curb, uh, uh, you know, which I refuse to do. And uh, what is this about? What is this about? Did we have a search warrant uh, for your house? Uh, let me see it. Where is the search warrant? Uh, they won't show me a search warrant. They say it's somewhere it's coming or someone over there has it, something to that effect. And uh, I'm still saying, what is this about? What is this about? Well, you know, we'll talk to you. Uh, uh, we, uh, and then finally they said that uh, there's an indictment coming down uh, on a Russian national who's in Russia. An indictment coming down later this morning. Uh, and... Uh, and if he ever come, he comes to the United States, he's going to be arrested or something to that effect. So, you know, we're not knowing what the hell is going on other than we're standing there with these armed white men uh, and who uh, there was one African who was there. And obviously he was there very reluctantly. I mean, it was very obvious to me looking at this guy that this was someplace that he did not want to be. <clears throat> you said something about Beyonce being able to quit. I'll get out of that, you know. Well, uh, that's what I was thinking. Well, you don't have to be here doing this, you know. So, so that's what happened. And uh, uh, finally, they asked me if I knew this person. There's a guy. Uh, his name is Alexander Ayanov, and I do know Alexander Ayanov. I've met him in the past. I've gone to conferences uh, that were sponsored by a group that he leads called the Anti-Globalization uh, Movement of uh, Russia, I think, something like that. And, and, uh, and they've, they've sponsored international conferences uh, on self-determination. That's, that's included people from Spain, uh, from Ireland, from all around the world. Uh, I've met Ukrainians there in, in this, uh, this meeting. And it's also included, uh, the this, this second time I was there, some weird white people who are talking about succeeding at California, succeeding, you know, they're going to Yeah, succeed. I remember that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think somebody may succeed in Texas. And I'm, I'm telling them, you know, uh, that ain't, we ain't touching this with a 10-foot pole. That if, if there were Mexicans who were talking about succeeding, we'd be right down with that because this is occupied Mexico and these white guys, just another group of colonizers competing with the main colonizer for control of of territory that is Mexican territory stolen from the Mexican people. Anyway, that that happens. And so that was that relationship. And through the anti-globalization movement, uh, they we did a, a tour, and I don't remember the exact year, a six uh, city tour uh, that was also connected with uh, the United Nations uh, doing some kind of investigation in the United States about the condition of black people. And we followed them uh, in various places trying to involve ourselves, charge the United States with genocide. We put, uh, in fact, um, a petition uh, on whatever that website is that people can sign in, in uh, petitions. And up to now, it's got, uh, you know, a hundred and some odd thousand people, Africans from around the world and in the United States who are signing in and making all kinds of extraordinary comments because they know what happens to African people here. So, uh, and then I'm to learn that we have a solidarity movement that you may be familiar with, uh, Comrade Jar, the African People's Solidarity Committee. I organized uh, the African People's Solidarity Committee uh, in 1976, uh, and that happened in St. Petersburg, Florida. And right now, they function in 130 uh, 37 uh, cities and about 30 states uh, in the United States doing reparation work. That's all they do. That's, the, that's not all. That's the primary work. They do reparations work, uh, and they also, uh, uh, that work includes uh, putting out in the white community, as we characterize behind enemy lines, uh, the conditions of black people in this country that white people ought to be supporting. <clears throat> That's what they do. So they, they open up, or we open up an office uh, in South St. Louis, uh, which is where the major most of the white people live, as opposed to North St. Louis, where we are located, um, uh, the international headquarters of our office is located. <laughs> so at the same time they're hitting us, they go to the Solidarity Center, 
They used battering rams uh, to knock the doors down. They also uh, used the flashbang grenades. Uh, and there was an apartment uh, 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 upstairs in that building. They uh, banged the doors in there. Uh, a man and woman who are part of our movement were in bed. They dragged them out. They put them at handcuffs on the gun, on, at gunpoint, uh, handcuffed them. They went to the home of uh, the uh, leader of the Solidarity Movement under my leadership. They banged, knocked the doors in, uh, destroyed the doors, uh, 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 put them on the gunpoint, had them sitting there. And uh, then they went to the Hooter House in St. Petersburg, Florida, knocked the doors in, they were off, <laughs> off the hinges, <clears throat> went in, uh, and uh, they stole something like 40 years of archives uh, in that building, 40 years of archives of, con of, our, of our struggle of black people, the struggle of our party and movement, et cetera. They stole my cell phone. They stole uh, my wife's cell phone, her, her computer. They stole my iPad. They stole her iPad. They stole <laughs> equipment and materials from all the people that I'm just mentioning and all the sentence that I just mentioned. <clears throat> we spent thousands of dollars since that time just to be able to have this discussion with you that I'm having now to replace the computers, replace the phones and things like that. Uh, uh, so effectively, that's what's happened. Now, I never saw a search warrant until mm -hmm. hours later that uh, I felt secure enough to go back to the house after they had left. They had knocked the doors down uh, of one house. They had broken the windows uh, in the house, had broken uh, the windows in the basement, <coughs> all of that stuff got to be repaired. Thousands of dollars have to go into repairing this. So I'm to here. Uh, by the way, uh, you may have heard uh, that either that day or the next day, Biden comes out with some kind of announcement that uh, he has uh, placed sanctions on Ironov uh, as a part of their efforts, because of their efforts to uh, affect elections in the United States, these wonderful elections, democ democratic elections in the United States. And uh, and then that they had made some arrests uh, of people in the United States. <coughs> Excuse me. If you need to, yeah, if you got some water, yeah, yeah, take it. Yeah. But I'm sure while you get your, while you get your, but, but I'm sure, cause, cause <coughs> when, when they give you all your stuff back, and produce all of the mountains of evidence showing a legitimacy for their raid all will be made clear right i mean because because clearly they must have videotape and sound recordings and pictures of you collaborating to overthrow this and do this than that and whatever the hell else you know there i mean what is it and in fact one of the questions i do have for you is to to maybe give an overview of what is the African People's Socialist Party, the Uhuru Movement, the Black is Back Coalition. What is it that you all actually are versus what is being characterized of your work now to justify this kind of abuse? Well, one thing I'm going to tell you is they are going to be able to produce. They're going to be able to produce uh, uh, an interview, a, web, a webinar that we did with Alexander Ayunov, um, maybe in, in sometimes April, maybe April, May, something like that, uh, uh, under the title, Ain't No Russian Ever Called Me Nigger, uh, <laughs> because uh, we came out in opposition uh, to the U.S. initiated war against Russia that's been going on uh, as quiet as it's kept for more than 100 years. When the United States and all of the colonial powers invaded Russia after the 1917 Russian Revolution, 1918, they invaded Russia, including Japan, the United States, and all of the colonial powers existing invaded Russia. And they've been pushing Russia since that time. They created uh, NATO in 1949 for the exact purpose of containing and destroying Russia. And so when I see NATO uh, on the border of Ukraine after they did Afghanistan to get closer to Russia, uh, after they did Afghanistan to overthrow a Russian supported government there that had brought the rights to women that they claim that they are so uh, protective of. After they did that, uh, all of those things, it's, it's really clear that the United States is on a mission. But the African People's Socialist Party was born out of 
the civil rights and black uh, and, and and black power movement of uh, of the 1960s. I organized the African People's Socialist Party in 1972. I'm a form. I was former member of SNCC. SNCC is the organization that projected the whole uh, black power uh, slogan demand uh, in 1966. Uh, and uh, so, <clears throat> so it's off of that. And then 1972, they've killed Malcolm by now. They've killed King, not the Russians. They've killed Martin Luther King, not the Russians, uh, who did hound it. They've killed Lumumba, not the Russians. In fact, America, France, uh, Belgium killed uh, Lumumba and then cut him up in little pieces and then put him in vats of, of acid. Not the Russians. Uh, they've overthrown Nkrumah. Not the Russians. America has done this. And, and so we, and they have... Uh, uh, assassinated after wounding and capturing Che Guevara in 1967 on my birthday. Uh, they've done all this. They've actually militarily defeated the Black Revolution of the 1960s. We were founded in 1972. They've killed Fred Hampton. I found this we, the they have killed, uh, we have founded the African People's Social Party in 1972 with the stated uh, determination to complete the Black Revolution of the 60s. There was nothing mealy mouthed about it. There was no pretext that we were some kind of American group that was fighting for some presumed democracy in America. We understood clearly that America was the enemy of black people and the strategic enemy of, of the masses of people around the world. So a party was created and we've been with the, uh, the 50th anniversary of the African People's Socialist Party was in May of, uh, of this year. The organization is 50 years old. We exist in various countries around the world in various cities uh, in this country. And, uh, and our objective is the liberation of Africa and black people globally, the unification of Africa, the unification of black people, the liberation global. That's what we're about. Uh, Justice Garvey was about and who experienced the wrath of the United States government frame up, FBI. Actually, the FBI uh, had to integrate it itself because they needed somebody black uh, to infiltrate the Garvey movement. And so, you know, uh, uh, FBI does all of this stuff. And so now, uh, now we are so stupid that we could not identify our own contradictions as a people uh, 50 years after our founding uh, that the Russians have to be telling us what to do. And the Russians have to tell us that Mike Brown lay in the, in the, on the streets on a hundred degree plus whether after being killed by an American soldier that they call the police in, in, in Huntsville, uh, uh, the Russians had to tell us that there was the U.S. military that had armed thugs that they call the police uh, who came out uh, to try to kill black people who rose up on Canfield Drive. The Russians had to tell us that. So some, this, this is the logic of what they're pushing forward. But nobody, nobody has bought into that. Or most people haven't bought into that anyway. So that's, that's uh, something about us. And so we exist. We exist. Uh, they kill uh, uh, So Bukwe. Uh, they they kill uh, uh, comrades there in South Africa. Uh, in fact, uh, you named uh, I I what is it? I print what is it? I uh, uh, Steve Biko. What was the thing that I, this? I write what I like. I and write. I do what I mix what I that we we yeah. borrowed that from him. Yeah, That's yeah. it. Yeah. Homage and so to they, him. Yeah, they killed Biko, and so but Biko is not dead. Malcolm is not dead because the African people sources was on the ground. In South Africa, where they kill uh, uh, Biko, where they kill Sobukwe, and what have carrying out the same policies and politics, and the and the Secretary General of the African Socialist International, that's the part of the international re reflection of the whole party, uh, is an African born in Congo. He's from Congo, so they, the moment they haven't they haven't succeeded in doing any of this, and that's a problem they got. And the other problem, I just want to say this, Comrade Jared, is that right now the, the so-called West, America, is suffering a serious kind of crisis, it's clear. And uh, nothing has worked for them. And uh, they need an explanation uh, for what's happening in the world. They couldn't get a single sycophant, neo-colonial power, a country uh, on the continent of Africa to support their position on Russia and the United Nations. Black people didn't support it. Most of the other peoples around the world didn't support them, the way they were, even in Indonesia and what have you. And black people in this country, generally speaking, don't don't buy that. So they're now concocting this thing to explain how they are so much better than Russia. This is part of the contest they had when the Soviet Union was existing, that they had to show that their way was the best way. Uh, uh, and even though you may be familiar with this comment, Jared, in 2020, 
at the uh, Munich Security Council that meets every year uh, to talk about you know, the situation in the world with hundreds of government officials from around the world. And uh, Zuckerberg was there. The, 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 the big contest, the big question, speaking of media and colonial colonizer, the big issue that in 2020 that they were grappling with is, uh, uh, what, how did they characterize it? Uh, 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 westlessness, the movement to westlessness. And that, that is the insignificance of the quote West that's based on colonialism. They like to pretend that the murderer in Buffalo, New York, who was influenced and informed by you will not replace us. And these mobs of white people who march in our streets, you will not replace us like that. That's something that's specific and peculiar uh, to this irrational white people when they have in this meeting with hundreds of people, including Zuckerberg, et cetera, discussing the possibility, probability of westlessness. That is to say the removal of the replacement of the white man in terms of the domination of the peoples around the world. So that's their problem. That's not my problem. And so they want to meet with me. And uh, I had an interview, I call it that, uh, yesterday with CNN. And it's clear, you know, that they are representing uh, the colonial powers. And, and you know, that's, that's, there's no doubt about that. And they're asking me about some charges of, uh, of uh, us being agents of Russia to affect American elections. And, you know, I said, there's no way we can even take that question seriously. Because if, in fact, uh, uh, that you were serious, uh, what you would be doing is saying that despite the fact that thousands of white people attacked the U.S. Capitol uh, in, on January 6th uh, because of the outcome of the election, despite the fact that there are four, more than 400 pieces of legislation in states throughout the United States that are limiting the rights of black people to vote, uh, uh, that there has not been a single flash bomb uh, uh, grenade uh, attack by FBI agents on Trump Tower or any of these other white people who were involved in that. So you want to have me engage in a discussion <laughs> that's typical to the, the slander, like when did you stop beating your wife? And to even engage in the discussion is to validate, is to give validity to the question. So you want to talk to me about Russia? Russia ain't my problem. Uh, well, do you think that Russia did this? Russia may be trying to do such and such a thing. I said, I, I don't know what Russia is doing. Uh, you know, I know Russia has the beef with the United States, but my beef is with the United States. I ain't got nothing to do with Russia. I'm not in some kind of love affair with Russia. My struggle has always been about the liberation of black people. And that's what I'm about. That's what the Uhuru movement is about. That's what the African People's Socialist Party is about. So we'll see what they do. I think they said this is supposed to air on today, but I'm, uh, you know, but I have, I've been to Moscow twice, but I've also been to Belfast during the era of the troubles when the British uh, were nakedly engaged in colonization there. I've been to South Africa. I've been to, Vena, uh, to Nicaragua. Uh, uh, I met Daniel Ortega. I met uh, uh, Nyoma, who was the father of so-called African nation of, of Africa of Namibia, and who led the uh, you know Swapo organization. So you know, I, I, there are thousands of white people leave this country every day, going to occupied Palestine that they call Israel, and you don't hear a single word uh, being made about them where they're killing Palestinians and keeping their land. So. You know, it's a bogus thing, and I, I refuse to talk to you about my relationship with Russia. I, I will talk to you about the fact that even in North St. Louis, where you had to drive in uh, the streets here, and you've seen it looks like a bombed out uh, situation where African people are catching hell, and you can see all the work that we've done. We, we, the African People's Socialist Party has begun a process of revitalizing and transforming North St. Louis. That's what you ought to talk about, and that's why they're attacking us because of this and because of the way that uh, the U.S. and all of the stuff that it's doing is being exposed uh, to the world and inside this country as well. I think also it has to be pointed out that part of this uh, attack on your organization uh, is, is a broad attack on black left radical politics. Uh, yes. So that, that the, 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 the <laughs> falsely positioned punditry that claims to represent black people can can get away with what it's doing. Uh, and whatever may be yours or anyone else's individual shortcomings, that is not why the state is crashing through your door. I mean, it's the same, you know, the, it, it, you know, the same 
uh, um, anyway, so so so, uh, but but I'm but I'm I'm still interested in the way that they want to frame your meeting with somebody, your communication with somebody or some groups as evidence that you've done something illegal or that you've had the kind of impact on American elections that uh, they claim. I mean, I think it's, it's, it's anyway, it's fascinating. Listen, is there anything else? I know we only have a few minutes left. I don't, I don't, you know, so I want to let, make sure anything else you want to leave us with is made clear. Um, uh, so please, if there's, if there's anything left for, that you want to lay out or uh, alert us to, uh, or have us uh, encourage in terms of behavior uh, or support. Uh, you know what? What? What is it that you? What is it that can be done? And what? What is it you would like us to know? Well, first of all, what can be done is what you're doing right now in terms of challenging their monopoly uh, of uh, this narrative. And people need to know exactly what happened and uh, be able to have a better explanation from what the government is doing. It it characterizes everybody who's ever been effective in defining what is happening to our people, not only here, but around the world uh, as terrorists, enemies of the people, they ter they characterize every, and I think what really must be understood is the fact that we have taken this revolution internationally, uh, that we have connected Africans around the world, and that we have, yes, uh, uh, worked with the uh, people, Af others around the world uh, to become a clear, uh, uh, operational part of the struggles of oppressed people everywhere, trying to consolidate that unity and solidarity also with the freedom of Africa and African people. So I think they need to do what you are doing now, put the word out, tell the story. Uh, they need to share this that we are talking about now. If they have a capacity to do that, they need to go to African APSP Uhuru, APSP U-H-U-R-U dot org. Uh, go uh, to their, they need to make public statements of support of the party and the Uhuru movement. Uh, various organizations are doing that right now all around uh, the country, expressing support and solidarity. I think that's what's going to be important, that they do not control this narrative, that they're not speaking in some kind of silo that we cannot break through. Uh, I think that's what needs to happen. And uh, so that would be helpful. And uh, also the Black is Black Coalition, you were a founding member of the coalition, John. You are the one who, uh, in a matter of five minutes or so, created the first PSA that was done for the Black is Back Coalition. And I think they should be aware also that the Black is Back Coalition is having its uh, 13th annual conference uh, on the 6th and 7th of August uh, in St. Louis, and they should go to Black is Back uh, coalition.org and register to come to St. Louis if you can. Come to St. Louis so you can see what frightens them so much about the kind of development that's happened there. Black is Bad coalition.org, register for the conference. And if you can't come, then participate uh, via social media, uh, et cetera. So that's what we will call on people to do. I do. I just want to highlight once again, very quickly, that uh, this, this, this point that in a moment where there is this reactionary response being promoted within the African world against Pan-Africanism, that the Pan-Africanism and internationalism that you all represent is getting this response from the state and the reverse backwards hashtag movements are getting platformed, funded, welcomed, written up glowingly, uh, et cetera, and so forth. So I just just want to just want to highlight that distinction in terms of how different politics and groupings are treated, uh, and that should say a lot. If, if and Gerald, on so. the way out of here, I also sure. think that uh, the people who I think I'm talking to now, and I think people who uh, are in the world, I think this whole notion that we're getting funds from the Russians uh, is crazy, and that what would besmirch our reputation is if we were getting money from the U.S. government and from the FBI, that's the problem, you see. And I think that's their problem, too, uh, that they can't buy us. They've never been able to buy us. And a whole bunch of white people throughout this country are paying reparations to us that's being reflected in this, this development that we're doing in St. Louis and various other places. The Russians don't owe us reparations. There's no African that I know with a Russian last name. 
The last names I'm familiar with come from the co white colonizers from England, from all these other kinds of. Hey, places. in fact, we used to joke all the time. <laughs> show me the show me a white Jefferson, exactly. uh, Washington, exactly. Jackson. You can't even find white folks yeah, with those yeah. names anymore. It's been so <laughs> imp imposed on enslaved <laughs> African people. This is ridiculous. Yes, yes, anyway, yes. yeah. Chairman O'Malley, I should tell her, it's always good to hear from you. Appreciate you coming through. Uh, we definitely express solidarity from this platform and we'll, we'll keep in touch and uh, uh, look to be as supportive as possible going forward. Uh, you know, uh, power to you and your crew and, and uh, um, respect to you and your family for having suffered that, that invasion. And I hope all is relatively well, uh, relatively soon. Uhuru, thank you so much, brother. All right. Yeah. Uhuru. All right, right on. Uhuru, take care. All right, everybody. Big shout out to Omali Eshetela and the APSP, Black is Back Coalition, and all uh, revolutionary Pan-Africanists uh, around the world. Uh, thanks to everybody who came through this morning and uh, those who will see this later. Uh, appreciate you as well. Uh, thanks again to Dev Springer for coming through. Uh, definitely appreciated all of that. And uh, shout out to Kalanji as well for, for setting us up appropriately with the proper definition and approach to Black August, which I hope you all have found was appropriately launched and appreciated in commemoration uh, on this show here today. So thank you all very much. Definitely stay tuned. Make sure you click all of the things, all of the, do all of the things you know you need to do to support this channel. Um, and uh, be here tomorrow morning for the Remix Morning Show all throughout the week. And I'll see you all on Friday. As Fred Hampton used to say to you, we say peace if you're willing to fight for it. In fact, only if you're willing to fight for it. Catch you next time here at I Mix What I Like in BPM. Take care, everybody. I mix what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like.